Hello. So I'm going to read The Boy Who Made the World Disappear by Ben Miller. <coughs> Prologue is like an introduction. Stories are often about a good person who does a bad thing. And this is no exception. The hero of our story is Harrison, and I do mean hero, because before we begin, I want to make one thing clear. Harrison had a huge heart. He cared about the rainforest, regularly bought his mother breakfast in bed, and always shared his toys with his younger sister, Lana despite the fact that she would often break them, lose them, or try to flush them down the loo. Harrison was kind to other children at school, even Hector Broom, who was a bit of a bully and once pushed Harrison over on purpose and then told their teacher, Miss Bolligan, that it was an accident. And Harrison was honest. If he broke a vase, for example, by accidentally knocking it off the shelf while pretending to be Bear Grylls, he would own up. He never stole from shops or cheated in Monopoly, or snuck into the circus without paying. He tried every new food three times without complaint, always held a grown-up's hand when crossing the road, and sometimes even folded his clothes at night instead of just chucking them on the floor. Sometimes. So, I hear you ask, if Harrison was so good, what bad thing could he possibly have done? Well, you see, as kind and honest and good and big-hearted as he was, Harrison had a big flaw. He couldn't control his temper. Most of the time, he was very well behaved, but once in a while, something would really annoy him. And then, well, then he would kick off. Oh! Harrison would groan in pure frustration. His head would lower like a bull about to charge. His cheeks would redden, his brow would furrow, his eyes would narrow, and he would clamp his jaw so tight it was a wonder that he didn't snap a tooth. Code Red, his father would cry, using his parents' nickname for Harrison's rages. Don't say that, Harrison would yell. Yes, definitely a Code Red, his mother would agree, moving breakable objects to safety. Ah! Harrison would shout, I hate it when you say that! From that point, there was very little anyone could do to calm Harrison down until he wore himself out. Ah! he might exclaim as he threw himself on the floor, kicking his legs so that he went round and round in circles like a break dancer. Why won't anyone listen to me? He might bawl as he ran off into the undergrowth, punching the bushes in fury. I want a different family! He might roar as he slammed the door to his room and barricaded it with every single one of his toys. Now, usually Harrison's rages happened not because he was really cross, but because he was worried about something. Which meant that most of the time, the grown-ups around him, his parents, for example, or his teachers, sort of understood. They'd wait out Harrison's meltdowns, then try to find out what he was really worried about so they could help him fix it. Then everything would go back to normal. <coughs> this story is not about one of those times. It begins at a birthday party and, well, I think I'd better just get started. Settle yourself down because it's a bit of a roller coaster. And as you shall see, it changed Harrison's life forever. Chapter one. Harrison had been anxious about Hector Broom's birthday party for weeks. Hector Broom was one of Harrison's least favorite people. He was one of the biggest children in Harrison's class and always picking on him. For example, if Harrison made up a game in the playground, Hector would ask to join and then change the rules so Harrison couldn't play. Or if they were playing football, he would trip Harrison up or push him off the ball. But by far the worst thing was Hector's elastic band. It was the perfect weapon, quick to use and easy to hide. When you were least expecting it, you'd feel the sharp sting of the elastic on your arm or, the, or your neck or your leg. And the next minute you'd be rolling around in pain. Just the thought of having to go to Hector's party put Harrison on edge but the whole class was going, and Harrison didn't want to be left out when everyone was talking about the party on Monday, so he had no choice. The only thing that made, uh, made going to Hector Broom's birthday remotely bearable was the theme, space, because Harrison loved anything to do with stars and planets. Plus, Hector had been bragging all week that his parents had booked a real-life astronaut as the entertainment. The astronaut's name was Shelley, 
She was staying with her grandmother, the school lollipop lady, for a special visit, so the brooms had booked her immediately for their precious son's party. Harrison couldn't wait to meet her. After all, she had actually been to space. The party started happily enough. There were space decorations all over the village hall and Hector's mother and father had ordered a big birthday cake topped with a silver spaceship crashing into the red planet next to a green alien with four eyes. Everyone had come in fancy dress. Harrison was a spaceman. Persephone Brinkwater was an alien. Charlie had come as a shooting star. Marcus down as a rocket and Charles was a, a sorry and Carl was a man from Mission Control. Katie Broad was an angel but no one said anything even though angels aren't the sort of thing you see in space. Hector Broom had predictably chosen to dress as the sun because he wanted to come as the most important thing in the solar system. Once the guests had arrived Hector's parents ushered all the children to the center of the room and soon everyone was sitting on cushions on the floor waiting impatiently for the main event. Harrison could, see, could feel his excitement growing at the mo as the moment he would meet a real-life astronaut grew closer. Then a menacing voice whispered in his ear, Just wait until my parents are gone. I'm going to get you. Harrison turned to see Hector Broom flexing his dreaded elastic band, an evil glint in his eye. And when we start the games, you'd better watch out. Harrison gulped. Perhaps he should have stayed at home after all. The lights dimmed and a voice called out, lift off in T minus 10, nine, eight. All the children began to join in. Seven, six, five. Hector's mother and father backed off towards the door. Harrison felt all his muscles go, go tense. Once they'd gone, who was going to protect him from Hector? Four. Three, two, one, ignition, blast off! Yelled a woman bursting out of the kitchen door. <clears throat> she had bright pink hair and was wearing the most brilliant outfit, just like the ones the astronauts wear, astronauts wear on the International Space Station. Despite his nerves, Harrison was really impressed. Hello children, I'm Shelley. We're going to have so much fun together. Now, who wants to go up to into space with me? She asked, looking around. Me, me, me! Everyone shouted. Hector's parents smiled at one another and closed the door. As soon as they'd gone, Hector flashed Harrison an evil grin. Not me! blurted Harrison. Excuse me, asked Shelley, staring at Harrison in, in surprise. I want to go home! Harrison cried, his panic at being pinged by Hector's, Hector's elastic band growing. But Harrison, said Marcus Down, you love space. No, I don't, shouted Har Harrison. It's boring. Of course, he didn't mean that at all. He was just scared of Hector. But Shelley didn't know that. Space isn't boring, she replied firmly with a frown. In fact, you have no idea how lucky you are. When I was a little girl, I'd have loved to, have go, loved to go to a party like this. She turned away from Harrison and dressed everyone else. OK, children, lie down and close your eyes. Everyone did as they were told and trying to ignore his worries, Harrison did the same. With his eyes shut, he heard Shelley drawing the curtains and turning off the lights. There was a click, followed by a humming sound. Open your eyes, Shelley instructed. <clears throat> Harrison did, and suddenly it was as if they were all floating in space. There were stars everywhere, swirling on the ceiling, covering the walls and falling to the ground. Who knows what a constellation is? Shelley asked. Harrison put his hand up, but Shelley picked Pers Persephone Brinkwater instead. Stars that make a shape, said Persephone. Very good, said Shelley. Now everyone look up and meet the great bear. She direct directed a laser pointer at the ceiling so that a bright red dot circled several stars, which, it had to be said, Look nothing like a bear. There's its head, explained Shelley, as the dot danced above them. There are its paws, there's its body, and those are its legs. If you say so, said Carl, and several, several of the children giggled. Can anyone guess what this constellation is, said Shelley, sounding slightly irritated. Her laser moved to another cluster of stars. Yet again, Harrison put his hands up. Shelley pointed to Charlie. Is it a bat? asked Charlie. Not quite, replied Shelley. 
though it does have wings, this is Cygnus, the swan. It's one of my favourites. Can you guess why? Because it has a very bright star in it, asked Hex he Hector Broom, without even putting his hand up. Really good guess, Hector, said Shelley. What a clever boy you are. And it is a very bright star. It's called Dineb, which means tail in Arabic, because it's in the tail of the swan. But the real, real reason Cygnus is one of my favourite constellations is right here. She took the laser pointed and squiggled it in a dark bit right in the centre of the swan. It's a black hole. Does anyone know what one of those is? Harrison, who knew all about black holes, sat up in excitement and waved both arms. I do, he said. I do. No one, said Shelley, pretending not to hear. After his outburst, she had decided that Harrison was a spoilt boy who needed to be taught a lesson. Well, it's basically a hole in the universe. It's completely black. So you wouldn't know it, it was there. But if you get too close, it will suck you inside and you will disappear forever. As she spoke, she, she switched off the laser pointer and the little point of red light on the ceiling suddenly vanished. <clears throat> there was a pause. The children stared at that little patch of sky where the black hole was lurking, feeling slightly freaked out. Right, said Shelley, climbing to her feet. Shall we play some games? She flicked a row of switches on the wall and the lights came back on. No, shouted Harrison. The other children had all stood up, but he was still lying on the floor. Excuse me, said Shelley. I don't want to play games, he cried. Suddenly, the only thing he could think about was Hector's elastic band. But they're space games, said Shelley, taken aback. You'll love them. We've got a Crete the new Neutron Star. That's like past the parcel. Sleeping Supernovas, which is a bit like Sleeping Lions. I love Sleeping Lions, cried Katie Broad. <coughs> ah! cried Harrison. Why isn't anyone listening to me? Harrison, said Shelley, a note of warning in her voice. I think you need to calm down. I want to see the stars again, he yelled. We're finished with the stars, said Shelley firmly. Now we're going to play games. Shall we start with a round of pin the satellite into low orbit Earth, low Earth orbit, Hector? You can go first. Hector stepped forward and, unnoticed by Shelley, he pulled his rubber band out of his pocket and aimed a menacing smirk at Harrison. Which is when Harrison really flew into a rage. This is the worst party ever, he hullabalooed. <clears throat> running around the room, kicking the cushions like footballs. And you are a rubbish astronaut! <coughs> now, wait a minute, said Shelley, getting increasingly cross herself. <coughs> I hate you, Harrison barked. I wish I could put you in the black hole. I wish I could put everything into a black hole. Like I care, bellowed Shelley, Shelley at the top of her voice. Harrison was so surprised to be yelled at back, he stopped in his tracks. You think I want to do this, howled Sherry? You think I want to be, be a pretend astronaut? I want to be an astronomer, not a children's entertainer. Silence fell in the room as the children sat with open mouths. Shelley wasn't acting like grown-ups were supposed to at all. You're not a real astronaut, asked Marcus Down. Of course I'm not, cried Shelley. Just like you're not real rockets, planets, stars or angels. Katie Broad began to cry. OK, OK, said Shelley, realising the situation was growing out of control. I'm sorry, just I've been through a lot recently. Persephone Brinkwater put her arm round Katie Broad, who was still wailing. Shelley took a deep breath and started again. Come on, let's play some fun games, she said, acting as if, as if nothing had happened at all. And then we can all have some delicious birthday cake. Of course, the party never really recovered. They did play pin the satellite into low, uh, low Earth orbit, but Harrison punctured the International Space Station and got disqualified. Then they played Accrete the Neutron Star and everyone won a to toy except for Harrison. Finally, they played Sleeping Supernovas and Shelley caught Harrison scratching his eczema rather than lying still. So she exploded him and he had to sit out for the rest of the game. All the while, Hector Broom snapped his rubber, rubber band with a threatening glare. By the time they were ready for their food, Harrison was in a very bad mood, and then things went from worse to, to, to disastrous. Harrison, 
I'm sorry, but you can't have any, called Shelley, as all the kids grabbed a slice of birthday cake. Why not, said Harrison, watching the others tuck into the delicious looking cake. Katie says you're allergic to dairy, Shelley said, and this cake isn't dairy free, so no cake for you. Well, I'm eating it, said Harrison, grabbing a chunk of cake. No, you're not, said Shelley. Step away from the cake. Ow! cried Harrison. His neck was suddenly red hot. He spun round to see Hector, who'd pinged Harrison with his elastic band. Is everything OK in here? said Hector's mum, interrupting the scene. Harrison looked up to see Hector's parents standing at the door. Through the window, Harrison could see the other parents arriving too. Oh, yes, fine. Everything's fine, isn't it, children? said Shelley. Her cheeks bloomed red, but Hector's mum didn't seem to notice. Did you enjoy the party? Harrison's mother asked him as, he sh as she walked over. Harrison looked at Shelley, then at Hector Broom, then back at his parents. Should he tell or not? Yes, I did, he nodded, crossing his fingers behind his back. Hector's mother clapped her hands. Thank you all for coming to celebrate our dear little angel's birthday. I'm afraid it's, afraid it's time for everyone to go home now, but I think we might have some special balloons for everyone to take with them and a party back too, Shelley. Of course, said Shelley. One by one, Shelley gave each child a party bag and a beautiful shiny helium balloon in the shape of a planet. There was a stripy brown and yellow Jupiter for Hector Broom and a purple Venus for Percy Fern Brinkwater. Charlie got a sky blue Neptune, Marcus down an orange Saturn with pink rings and Carl a bluey green Uranus. Katie Broad got a silvery Mercury, which was very lucky because it matched her angel costume. Finally, it was Harrison's turn. Have you got a balloon for Harrison? His mother asked Shelley. Oh yes, said Shelley. Something flickered in her eyes. I've got a special balloon for Harrison. Just wait here one minute. She disappeared into the kitchen, closing the door behind her. What was your favourite bit of the party? Asked Harrison's father. When we saw the black hole, said Harrison. The sound of banging came from the kitchen. What's a black hole? asked his mother. It's a hole in the universe, said Harrison. They're very dangerous, because if you fall inside one, you'll never get out. What do they look like? Like a hole, said Harrison, that's black. There was a whizzing sound from the kitchen, as if something was being put in a blender, then bang! The kitchen door blew, clean off its hinges, sailed across the hall, slammed against the opposite wall and clattered onto the floor. There, Framed in the doorway was Shelley. Her spacesuit was covered in soot and all her pink hair was on end. In her right hand was a piece of string and floating at the end of it was a weird black circle. Um, are you OK? asked Harrison's father. Here's your balloon, Harrison, said Shelley, trying to give tying the string to his wrist. It's very kind of you, said Harrison's mother. My pleasure, said, my pleasure, said Shelley. He deserves it. Harrison reached out his hand took hold of the string and pulled the balloon towards him. It was pitch black, like a piece had been cut out of the universe. He blew at it to see if it bobbed backwards like a balloon should, but instead it loomed ever so slightly closer. I wouldn't do that if I were you, Shelley Vaughan. In fact, best not to touch it. Harris's father gave her a quizzical look. In case it pops, said Shelley, smiling a big innocent smile. Well, what do you say, Harrison? asked his mother. Thank you, said Harrison politely. You're most welcome, Harrison, said Shelley with a glint in her eye. You are most welcome indeed. Chapter two. As Harrison walked home with his parents, he stood his extraordinary balloon. In fact, he couldn't take his eyes off it. He was vaguely aware of crossing the village green and climbing the hill to their cottage. But it was as if all happening, it was as if it was all happening to someone else. The balloon was like a huge dark magnet pulling him in. He stared deeper and deeper into its depths, looking for a place to rest his eyes, a shape, maybe, moving in the black or a tiny chink of light. light. But there was nothing. Harrison was starting to wonder if it even was a balloon or something altogether more mysterious. Ruff! A large bow bark startled Harrison from his thoughts as he set a sharp thought as he thought. 
A large bark startled Harrison from his thoughts as a set of sharp white fangs snapped shut about a centimetre from the end of his nose. He leapt in fright, letting go of the string. Luckily, the balloon was tied to his wrist, otherwise it would have floated away, and, well, this would pretty much be the end of the story. Harrison knew that terrifying bark and those razor-sharp teeth all too well. They belonged to Blue, his neighbour, Mr Hardwick's black and white border collie. His heart began to race and he started to feel faint. Help! he cried. Just turn your back, Harrison, said Mr Hardwick, leaning over the fence. Blue won't hurt you. Stand still and you'll soon lose interest. Harrison did as Mr Hardwick suggested and turned away from the dog. Then he felt Blue's hot breath on his neck and sh as she snapped her teeth just millimetres from his right earlobe. He turned back around and tried to shoo the dog away. Don't wave your arms, said his mother calmly. She thinks you want to play. Harrison held his arms close to his chest. He could feel his heart thumping against his ribs like a crazed hamster trying to break out of a cage. Blue darted in front of him and kept jumping up, barking and snapping her teeth in his face. It was unbearable. Oh! yelled Harrison. Oh, don't be silly, Harrison, said his father. Blue's just being friendly. The next few seconds felt like hours as his parents continued their conversation with Mr Hardwick. Harrison twisted and turned, doing everything he could to avoid Blue's yapping and snapping. But the dog wasn't giving up. This was much too fun a game. She crouched low on the pavement, prepared to leap, sprang from the ground. Harrison shut his eyes tight and ducked. For the longest time, he stayed in that position with his eyes closed, expecting to be torn apart at any moment. But nothing happened. He opened his eyes. They left our recycling box behind, Harrison's mother was saying, because we put our soggy tissue in it. I thought paper was recyclable. Harrison looked up and down the lane. Lou was nowhere to be seen. That's the council for you, Mr Hardwick replied. They love to make things difficult. Where had that dog gone? Harrison couldn't make any sense of it. And then he remembered he was still holding his balloon. It's a very strange balloon. Couldn't have anything to do with a dog disappearing, could it? He crouched down, just like when he had when Blue had sprung at him, and looked up. As he suspected, the balloon was hovering directly above him. So when Blue had leapt for him, he could easily have hit it. What if she'd crashed into the blackness and vanished? Harrison shook his head. Nah, that was ridiculous. Blue must have jumped right over him and run off down the street while he had his eyes shut. Perhaps she'd seen a squirrel and run after it or heard a cat wailing down, over, uh, down on the village green. Harrison, are you all right? His father asked. Harrison didn't say anything. His mind was whirring with possibilities. Could Blue have really disappeared into the balloon? And if so, did that mean he could make other things disappear?